Hey folks, welcome back. I'm gonna finish up the plant nutrition part of the, of the course here. Um, before I get into the, the last section on nutritional adaptations, I wanna show a little bit of a summary um, that summarizes from, uh, from different types of soils and soil formation through the acquisition of those nutrients um, from the soil water. Um, in plants and summarize a bit of the information that we've that we've seen. I'm going to go ahead and share um, a screen with you that uh, hopefully will work and we can summarize this information. So we've seen this uh, type of summary before and I'll post this on on our BB Learn site as well um, so you can watch this again in that form separately. Go ahead and start that. Soil formation, which begins with solid rock, is a very slow process that takes many years. The rock is broken down into smaller pieces by the action of wind and water, a process known as weathering. In areas that experience below freezing temperatures, the repeated freezing and expansion of water in small fissures and pits in the rock surface accelerates soil formation. As the rock surface becomes more irregular, wind-blown dust and rock debris accumulate in small protected pockets. Some organisms, such as lichens, can exist in these areas. Lichens are usually the first organisms to take hold in forming soil. Many lichens produce small branches or lobes that stick up from the rock surface and trap dust and bacteria. Lichens also produce acidic compounds that dissolve the rock surface. The lichens eventually die and decompose, adding organic material to the forming soil. Eventually, there is enough soil to support mosses. Mosses tend to be larger than lichens and have a higher profile on the rock surface, trapping even more dust. Because of their larger size, they generate more organic material when they decompose. Fissures in the rock surface are continually widened by the freeze-thaw cycle and through erosion by wind, water, and organisms. Eventually, the rock is broken down into small particles with enough organic matter or humus mixed in to support larger plants. When you take a closer look at soil, you can see that it's made up of particles of various sizes. Depending on their size, the particles are classified as gravel, sand, silt, or clay. Mixed in with rock particles are organic compounds produced by living organisms or by the decomposition of dead organisms. The proportions of organic and inorganic matter in the soil, along with such environmental factors as moisture content and acidity, determine how easily plants take up minerals from the soil. In addition to carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, plants need nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, and various other elements. Many of these elements are found in the soil as ions. Negatively charged ions tend to remain dissolved in water, so they are readily available for absorption by plant roots. Positively charged ions, on the other hand, are attracted to negatively charged clay and organic particles in the soil. Soils with large amounts of clay and organic matter are rich in mineral ions, but it's hard for plants to absorb these ions because they're tightly bound in the soil. How do plants maximize their uptake of water and minerals from the soil? One strategy is to increase the surface area for absorption. In a growing root tip, root epidermal cells form root hairs, thread-like extensions that stick out into the soil. These hairs greatly increase the amount of cell wall and cell membrane in contact with the environment. Ions pass readily through the plant cell walls. For the nutrients to be metabolized, however, they must cross the highly selective plasma membrane. Most ions cross the plasma membrane in one of two ways, by passive transport or by active transport. Some ions can enter the cell through channel proteins. These proteins have an opening through which the ions can diffuse. This process, which requires no energy expenditure by the cell, is called passive transport. In passive transport, substances move spontaneously down their concentration gradients from regions of higher concentration to regions of lower concentration. 
In contrast, if the cell is transporting ions against their concentration gradients, the cell must use active transport, a process that requires the cell to expend energy. In this example, the cell expends energy in the form of ATP to transport protons against their gradient to the outside of the cell. The removal of a phosphate group from ATP releases the energy necessary to pump protons across the plasma membrane. The protons, carrying potassium ions with them, now diffuse spontaneously down their gradient via a proton-potassium co-transporter. The energy released by protons moving down their gradient fuels the movement of potassium ions against their gradient into the cell. In this active transport process, energy from the breakdown of ATP is ultimately used to transport potassium ions into the cell. Okay, so that is a little summary of much of what I talked about. Um, and so I, like I said, I'll post that as well. Um, and, uh, and you'll have an opportunity to, to review that. Okay, what I'd like to do now is move into the last, uh, into the last bit of material associated with the plant nutrition, and that is the nutritional adaptations. And so um, I ended right here last time. Um, and so there are a number of, of, of types of nutritional adaptations. I'm going to mention just a few of them here. Um, and associated with these are morphological uh, characteristics and, um, and morphological and physiological um, adaptations to dealing with these different situations. The first of these are in epiphytes. So epiphytes are plants that grow on uh, the leaves or branches of, of other plants. Um, and so epiphytes' roots never touch the ground. They absorb nutrients, so they never really enter the soil. They absorb nutrients from rainwater that collects on the plants that they, that they grow on. Um, and, and they do this in, in several different ways. And so here's just a few different groups of, uh, of epiphytes. Um, showing orchids here, aeroids, these are common tropical epiphytes, bromeliads, I think many of you are familiar with these, some are, um, are common house plants that people have, and then there are many different epiphytic ferns. The thing that I want to emphasize here, these are not, this is not a parasitic relationship, um, this is more of a commensal relationship, they're not doing damage per se um, to the host plant, um, but rather just using that for structural support. Um, and, uh, but the trade-off here, while they get their leaves and bodies up into the canopy or you know, where they can capture light or compete better for light, the trade-off here is that they don't, they're, the harvesting of those nutrients that are typically diffuse in the soil is much more difficult. Um, and so they have to have some special adaptations to be able to get water and nutrients um, in their, uh, uh, from water and nutrients collected from the, the sort of host plant uh, in this epiphytic relationship. And so some of those nutritional adaptations that, um, that these, some of the nutritional adaptations that these epiphytes have include um, leaves that are arranged in a rosette. Um, and so this is really common in bromeliads. Uh, with rosette arrangement of leaves into what are referred to as tanks. Um, and here we see a tank um, that is all these bromeliad leaves arranged in this rosette where the water, any rainwater actually collects down into, um, into those tanks. In, a, uh, in, in addition to water, of course, any detritus, any debris coming down from the plant or from other animals um, are deposited into these, these tanks as well. Um, and so they get both nutrients and water um, from the, as epiphytes from inside of these tanks. And so there are also a number in the tropics of different animal species that use these tanks. Um, and that can, and so including like frogs, for example, for reproduction and other amphibians, um, and that adds to the nutrients that are that are in um, that are in these. 
The other example that's shown on this slide is some an adaptation associated with the roots of, uh, of a common epiphyte, and these are the aerial roots of orchids. And so these aerial roots, you know, roots are obviously for harvesting those diffuse nutrients in the soil and anchoring to the substrate. The aerial roots in orchids, um, which are shown here, actually have a special uh, layer on the outside called velamen. And that velamen layer is this sort of whitish layer that we see on the outside. If you look at it in cross section, here's a cross section of a root, that velamen layer is on the outside and it's sort of the spongy um, layer. It is specifically adapted for absorbing nutrients from rainwater and from the atmosphere. And so the orchids actually are able to get a lot of these through their roots, um, but through a lot of the nutrients and water requirements through the roots, but through the, because of the velamen layer um, that's associated. So they have these specialized roots with this layer of velamen on the outside um, that helps to, to absorb the necessary water and nutrients from in this epiphytic uh, life history. Okay, one of my favorite nutrient uh, nutritional adaptation is parasitism. And I mentioned that only because um, part of my research program actually studies a group of parasitic plants. Um, and, and, and so I find this uh, to be quite fascinating and a lot of study has been done on this. And so parasitic plants are um, what we refer to in general as heterotrophic. So what heterotrophic, it, it, this is contrasting with autotrophism. So autotrophism are what we refer, what we think of as most plants. Plants make their own food, they're autotrophic. Heterotrophic uh, organisms or plants grow, feed, and are sheltered on uh, by a different plant or a different organism. Contributing nothing to the host. And so that host plant um, doesn't get anything from this situation. In fact, these do damage to the host. And so that's the de definition of, that's the definition of uh, heterotroph or parasitism and this heterotrophic life habit, life history. And so the example that I'm showing here are parasitic plants, and there's a couple of different types of parasitic plants. And so on the left-hand side here is, uh, is a parasite, Aphilon uniflorum. Um, Aphilon is, uh, I think I've shown you this picture before, um, is reduced to basically just this flowering stalk, this one flora, or this one flower. Um, and it here, its root system is this short little stubby root system that is attached to this host plant. And so the host plant is green and photosynthetic and the parasite is not, it has no leaves, it's not green, it doesn't do photosynthesis. It obtains all of its nutrients from, uh, um, from the photosynthesis that is going on in this host plant here. And so this is something called a hostorial parasite. And it's making a root, root connection to a host plant. So the host is doing the photosynthesis, acquiring water. The, uh, the hostorial parasite is sucking all of those, all that photosynthetic water right out of that host plant. Um, there is another group of, uh, of parasitic plants that are called mycotrophs. And mycotrophs are parasites of fungi. So these are parasitic on mycorrhizal fungi. So I've talked about mycorrhizal fungi with you. Mycorrhizal fungi are 
those fungi that are associated with plant roots and they have a mutualistic relationship delivering water and nutrients to the plant and taking photosynthate or sugars from the plant. That's a mutualistic relationship. Well, mycotrophic plants like this, uh, like this Indian pipe right here, um, Monotropa uniflora, this, this is actually a plant that's parasitizing those mycotrophic fungi, or the, sorry, parasitizing those mycorrhizal fungi. And so this is actually like a plant three-way. This is a menage a trois between the plant, the fungus, and the plant, the parasite. And so where the parasite is stealing its sugars and nutrients from the fungus, which is getting those from the plant. Um, and so between the plant and fungus, there's that mutualistic relationship, the host plant and the fungus, there's that mutualistic relationship. And then the, the parasitic, that mycotroph is actually stealing from the fungus. Um, originally, these mycotrophs were thought to be um, actually decaying organic matter. They were called saprophytes. They thought that the plants themselves were actually like fungi often do, decaying organic matter and extracting the nutrients from that decaying organic matter. And it wasn't until recently that they actually were able to show through radioisotopes that the carbon that the mycotroph is actually getting it, from the, it, is coming from the um, fungus and that fungus is getting that carbon from the host plant. So we have tree species photosynthesizing associated with the mycorrhizal fungi. And the fungi are happily giving them water and nutrients and, and taking carbon um, that the plants photosynthesized. And, the, um, and then this, par this parasitic mycotrophic plant is coming in, parasitizing the fungi and stealing that carbon from them. Uh, super cool relationship. Um, the, between these three different organisms going on here. So anyway, these are parasitism is a nutritional adaptation in plants to be able to get nutrients um, from a separate, from another plant. And it, it actually has evolved um, at least 20 or 25 times independently um, in plants. And so here is a phylogeny of all of our plants, or of, of our seed plants, um, including angiosperms that are sort of expanded out to the order level here, um, and our gymnosperms down, our other seed plants down here. And we see that in angiosperms, parasitism, the hostorial parasites shown in blue, um, and the mycotrophs shown in red, have evolved multiple times independently in many different groups of, of angiosperms and has evolved at least one time in gymnosperms as well, um, which is really fascinating. Um, and these have, and, and in some of these cases, this is a really old origin. Um, you know, maybe 100 million years ago, uh, this, this relationship evolved in some groups where it's still evolving um, in, in younger groups as well. So we have um, the evolution of parasitism has happened multiple independent times um, in the past and, and um, in, in the deep past and in the recent past. And what these all have in common, whether they are hostorial parasites um, or, uh, or mycotrophs is, uh, what these have in common is that obtaining their nutrients from a different uh, organism, so the heterotrophic relationship. In hostorial parasites, the reason that we call them hostorial parasites is actually the organ that they make, which is called a hostorium. And the hostorium is actually a modified root that we see in both stem parasites and root parasites. So hostorial parasites can uh, penetrate, uh, can form hostoria in their modified roots and penetrate stems and steal nutrients, or they can do root-to-root -root connections like that, a fill-on uniform that I showed you. Um, here is an example of a stem parasite. This is called daughter. Um, 
daughter is in the genus Cuscuta, and it's this this twining spaghetti like uh, spaghetti looking plant with no green color, no leaves, and it's just these stems wrapping around the host plant, which is green and photosynthetic here. And what it's doing is it has this hostorium, a modified root um, that has both the hold fast, uh, and I'll point these out, and a penetrating organ. that are uh, for penetrating the host plant's vascular system. And this can be either in the root or in the stem. And so the Hostoria typically has this two parts to it, a hold fast, and the hold fast is just there's this enlarged area that provides counter pressure for the penetrating organ. And the penetrating organ are shown right here. And that penetrating organ actually penetrates down into the host vascular tissue. And so we see the host phloem. Um, is pointed out here. There's our host phloem and here's our host xylem. And that penetrating organ can tap into the phloem and the xylem and steal both water and nutrients as well as photosynthate um, from, the, uh, from, the, from the host plant. But that the hostorial parasites have in common um, the development of hostoria on their roots. Uh, and use this hostoria to uh, sites. use this hostoria to hostorium to actually um, penetrate the vascular tissue of the host plant and steal those plants. And in these hostorial in in parasites, there are actually two different types of um, there are two different types of paras parasitism that go on. Um, and so these can either be, and this has to do with how much they, what, how much, whether they do photosynthesis at all and what they take from the host plant. And so in holoparasitic plants, holo means all, these are, they, these get all of their nutrients and water, um, all of their nutrition from a host plant. So all nutrition. And this nutrition includes water, mineral nutrients, and, uh, um, and photosynthate, or sugars. And they get all of this nutrition from the host plant. So as such, these holoparasites, as we'll see, are typically very reduced. Um, and reduced to just their reproductive organs, typically. They don't have any leaves. They have no need for leaves. They've got, they have no leaves for photosynthesis. They're typically no green color. Oftentimes the chloroplast genome, so the genes that actually encode everything for photosynthesis is also reduced. And so these are really reduced down plants just down to their reproductive organs, the flowers in many of these cases, um, because they're getting all their nutrition from that host plant. And this is contrasted with hemiparasitic plants. And hemiparasitic plants get both water and mineral nutrients from a host, but still photosynthesize themselves. So these are still green with leaves, etc. Except uh, they're, they're taking all their water and their mineral nutrients from that host plant. So this is a little bit different. Um, in that uh, most of the time you actually don't, you'll see these and we'll see a few that are things that you probably will recognize. Um, they are, you wouldn't know necessarily that these are parasitic. Um, 
but it turns out that there's a many, many hemiparasitic plants, and it may be one stage in the progression towards holoparasitism to first be hemiparasitic. And some of the research in my lab is actually looking at the evolution of holoparasitism and how they transition through hemiparasitic, uh, uh, hemiparasitic um, sort of background before evolving to holoparasitism. Um, this is something that was called a transition, an evolutionary transition series to go from autotrophic to hemiparasitic to holoparasitic. Um, and we've been investigating sort of how frequently that happens in these groups of parasitic plants transitioning through a hemiparasitic background. So these are two main categories. There's a bunch of other categories, whether they're obligate, they have to have a host to complete the life cycle, um, which includes all holoparasitic plants, but just some of the hemiparasites, because there are some hemiparasites that are facultative parasites. They don't require a host to complete their life cycle. And as I mentioned, you can be a stem parasite or branch parasite that's growing above ground, like that cuscuda, the daughter that I showed you, or you could be a root parasite where you're making root to root connections um, um, with, the, with the roots of that host plant. Okay, I just wanna show you a few examples of these because I think they're cool. Um, so uh, on the top here, right, is foradendron. This is also known as mistletoe. Um, yes, this is the mistletoe that we, uh, that we you know, that's a symbol during uh, um, the holidays, during Christmas time for, um, uh, a symbol with, for kissing underneath the, the mistletoe. I don't know where that comes from per se, um, but the mistletoe itself is often, in, during the winter time, one of the only green things that are up in plants. And so I could see this like hanging above you during the winter where all the other plants are deciduous um, as being sort of why this is recognized at that time anyway. So foradendron is a branch parasite. You'll notice that these are all green and photosynthetic. And so these are all hemiparasites where they're either branch parasites or, um, or stem par or root parasites, um, but like a branch parasite like foradendron or a root parasite like castilea. So this is the paintbrush, um, which many of you have seen around here. This is a group that I uh, studied a lot of the taxonomy and evolution of, um, but you probably didn't realize that that was actually a parasite. So these are stealing water and nutrients from all of the plants around them, the host plants around them. Um, and some of these are bad crop pests. This is witchweed or striga here, and it's actually parasitizing sugarcane um, in this sugarcane plantation, and actually does damage to the crop, um, and is something that is, uh, um, you know, a crop pest and needs to be controlled. And there's a lot of research to controlling those. Here's a few holoparasites. These are some of the weirder looking ones. Um, these are not green and photosynthetic, and they're reduced down to just reproductive uh, flowers. So um, in this prosopanchy or hydnora, these are things that don't even look like plants when we look at them. Um, they're so highly modified. A lot of times these are originally thought to be fungi, um, and only later on, with a little bit of closer examination, you realize that these are flowers. They have these highly modified flowers and inflorescences or, or arrangements of flowers but they're holoparasitic. They're not doing any photosynthesis themselves. Um, a couple others, uh, these are in the family Rafflesia. This is actually um, uh, in Southeast Asia and is the largest flower. These can get up to be three feet in diameter and they smell like rotting flesh um, and attract flies for pollinators. Uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, this huge flower, the body of the plant actually exists only in the roots of the host plant, and then it will emerge as just the flower. And so it's reduced down to just that flower. And there's actually, in this Rafflesiaceae, this family, there's this huge uh, array of different morphologies um, associated with these big flowers. Really cool holoparasites as well. Um, a couple other holoparasites that look more like plants. So this is the parasite growing out of the host plant here. This is this branch parasite where the flowers just pop out of the branches here of the parasite. Um, and then here are some root parasites that are, that are holoparasites. So they're reduced just to their floral displays. No green photosynthetic leaves because they don't need that. They get all of their nutrition from their host plant. But these are root parasites that are root holoparasites.
I've shown you Cuscuta already. This is a, a pic, better picture of it. This is something you uh, grows around here. You will see this um, uh, if you if you're paying attention. And uh, one of the cool things about uh, Cuscuta is that when the seedling germinates, they actually start immediately looking for host plants by circling around. And there's been some experiments that have actually asked the question, do they have a preference in host plant? And growing a couple of different host plants within, uh, within proximity of it and seeing whether they preferentially choose one or the other. And it turns out that they do tend to have a preference towards certain plants. The, um, and that's really cool to see sort of plant choice going on in what they're parasitizing. But if we look at their, while their bodies are really different from what we think of as a plant, you look at their flowers and their reproductive organs are relatively um, unchanged compared to their rel related plants in the morning glory family. Um, a few more examples of some holoparasites. These are root holoparasites. Um, and you see that they're reduced down to basically just the groupings of flowers, the inflorescences. Um, these are some of my favorites in the family Orobankaceae. Um, the, the paintbrushes are part, the hemiparasitic paintbrushes are part of this Orobankaceae um, family. Um, and I meant, so those are all hostorial parasites. There's also these mycotrophic parasites. And so mycotrophs don't have hostoria. Um, and instead, they, like I was saying, um, actually parasitize mycorrhizal fungi. And so here we see that Indian pipe, its roots are very, very reduced um, because they are uh, penetrating the mycorrhizal fungi that are in the soil. And so here is actually shown um, one of the roots of. Uh, monotropa, this Indian pipe, penetrating the fungal hyphae and stealing the carbon that these mycorrhizal fungi are getting from a, from a tree that they are mutualistically associated with. Um, and it turns out that mycotropes agru, uh, uh, occur in plant groups that are especially, that have especially close relationships with mycorrhizae, mycorrhizal fungi, like the ericaceae or the, the blueberry or huckleberry family. And the question's been asked of whether this is a pre-adaptation. So is mycorrhizal association the pre-adaptation for um, evolving uh, heterotrophy or mycotrophy in these groups? And this is an unanswered question still. So let's look at a few of these. They include both hemiparasites, like this monesis up here. and holoparasites like the Indian pipe that I showed you before as well as others. So you've got both hemi and holo mycotropes um, associated uh, um, in this family, Eric Casey. Um, mycotrophism has evolved in other groups as well. Gentians um, are one and then another that you're familiar with are orchids and Actually, in our flora, we have quite a diversity of this Coralorhiza. Um, this oftentimes you'll find growing underneath Douglas fir um, trees. Um, Douglas firs are mycorrhizal with, uh, uh, with fungi that these then are parasitizing. And so this time of year, we're just starting to see these um, come out of the ground and they'll flower here in the late spring and early summer um, in our forests. And so I encourage you to get outside and find some of these uh, parasites. Both Monotropa uniflora and the Ericaceae and this Coralorhiza occur um, as uh, parasitic plants that we can find, holoparasites that we can find out in our, um, in our forests in the, in the Northern Rockies here. And then I'll just end the parasitism part by saying that this has evolved at once, one known example of this evolving in, um, in gymnosperms, in the family Podocarpaceae, this is a mostly southern hemisphere uh, gymnosperm family that we're not as familiar with, but there is one uh, parasite. This looks to be a hostorial uh, um, parasite, a root parasite parasit called Parasitaxis, um, and this is the parasite then penetrating the roots of these host plants here. Um, uh, you can see no green color, very reduced form, um, but a parasitic gymnosperm, which that's, uh, that's amazing. So super cool um, that parasitism has evolved so many times independently 
um, to deal uh, uh, so many times independently and, and um, in similar ways and with similar morphological results. Okay, the last nutritional adaptation that I wanna bring to your attention is carnivory. We've already talked about carnivory a little bit when we talked about modified leaves. Um, but uh, I'll just mention that here that um, carnivory is a specific adaptation to supplement nitrogen in um, nutrient poor environments. And, and, and this, as we'll see, has evolved multiple times independently. And so to be considered a carnivorous plant, there is a specific definition to be considered carnivorous. And these are plants that have to absorb, nutri absorb nutrients from dead bodies of prey that are adjacent to their surface, so the plant surface. Uh, and um, so they have to absorb nutrients from those dead bodies and they have to get some advantage from that um, and receive an advantage. So that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And so what that advantage is, is sort of better growth or reproduction. And so there are, uh, like I said, this has evolved independently and in different ways in different plant, plants. And so we talked about pitcher plants. Actually, pitchering is, uh, has evolved in multiple different plant families. So we'll see pitcher or in multiple different plants, uh, uh, in multiple different genera. Um, and so we see different types of pitchers, uh, both in temperate and tropical nutrient poor environments to supplement the nitrogen. They have those digesting enzymes and fluids and uh, communities inside of those pitchers um, that digest and the plants get their nitrogen from that. They also have the nutritional, um, and so there's also, there are other ones. Another one that people are familiar with, of course, is Venus flytrap. Um, this is a modified leaf that actually has a trigger mechanism to close on prey and digest them. Here, there's this little lizard inside of this, uh, this pitcher, or sorry, inside of this Venus flytrap. Um, another really cool one are sundews. Sundews actually have really sticky hairs. Um, on the ends of their leaves and the uh, insects will get trapped in those sticky hairs and then will actually curl up on them and digest them when they curl up. And so it's the sticky trap part of that. And then there are multiple other uh, types. These are just three that are, that are pretty common that you are, may be familiar with. Um, but we've got things like ladder warts that actually have a trap that is an active mechanism and grabs insects in an aquatic environment. And there's a great blog post on this one, check that uh, in, our, in our class blog. Um, so check that out. So there are other types of carnivory, um, uh, but to be, to be carnivorous, we're absorbing nutrients from dead bodies adjacent to the surface of the plant um, and receiving an advantage from that. And so with that definition, a group of researchers actually looked across all angiosperms and asked, how many times has parasitism evolved and in what groups? And so this is a paper by Givnish, um, sorry, Givnish et al. in 2015 in the journal uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And what they found in this is that carnivory has evolved nine different times, at least, nine uh, independent origins. So nine times independently. So nine independent origins of carnivory um, in, uh, in angiosperms. And that's, that's really cool. And I will just say that I'm actually on the committee of a uh, graduate student at the University of British Columbia, who's getting ready to defend. and, and they've found um, 
another uh, origin of carnivory that's not in, on this table here that, that's being described and that's actually in the monocots, um, a separate origin of, uh, origin of carnivory. So that's really cool as well. Um, okay, so nine different uh, evolutions in, in multiple different lineages of both monocots and dicots uh, for, um, for carnivory implants. Okay, so that's gonna wrap up our um, plant nutrition portion of the course. And um, we're gonna move into talking about angiosperm reproduction uh, next week. All right, thanks.